we, we were at a point that I didn't really see where I was going to go any further. That's, that's hard for some people to understand sometimes that, you know, you're not just buying that horse, you're, you're buying those emotions. So sometimes you're going to pay maybe two or three times what that horse is actually worth. I wanted to keep growing the business because, you know, for me, any business I'm in, my goal is to build it to sell to someone bigger. Welcome back to the Wealthy Cowboy Show. Today we have uh, Jeremy Barwick on. Uh, you've probably heard his name around the cutting horse world, the horse sale wor world, uh, now getting involved in the rope horse fraternities, uh, also in the breeding game. And um, I'm excited to have him on and share some insight through his progression in life uh, of, of just growing up around horses and now getting in the business of horses. So how's it going? Going good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I think like in my life and then everybody I've talked to, you know, it's kind of a progression. Like, like when I graduated college, I thought cowboying and making $500 a week was like a great living. And now like, it seems like $500 a day isn't very much. So I want to talk about like, <clears throat> I think you've kind of progressed that direction and starting out what I know about your background. Like you were just started out in horses and love of horses and then you're like, how can I be involved in this? And then it kind of grew, and now to being a business owner and being in that business of horses. Uh, so if you can just start out kind of your background when you were a kid, like in high school and stuff, what was your background with horses and your family life and all that? Yeah, so I grew up in South Georgia. Um, my parents divorced when I was, I don't know, third or fourth grade. Um, we kind of lived a little more in the city. My grandparents lived in the country, had horses. My grandpa trained horses. Uh, so I ended up moving in with my grandparents and, and living with them and finishing out school with them because I wanted to be around the horses. Um, did that, you know, finished high school, really didn't didn't want to go to college. Uh, got a job with a lady there in South Georgia, my first job riding horses. I think I started out making like 150 bucks a week or something, mm -hmm. not very much, and stayed with her. I guess I went to work for her when I was maybe 18. And I was there until I was 25. And I think even when I left after that, I was making 450 bucks a week or something, not very much. But she gave me a great start into the business, Teresa Watson. And I mean, she, she really gave me a lot of opportunities and let me do a lot of things that normally I wouldn't get to do. But if I was going to be in the horse business, I felt like I needed to move to Texas. So I really just up and moved. I had a truck, a trailer, and a few outside horses and brought them to Texas and lived out in Lingleville and rented a place out there and lived there until I eventually ended up buying a place and building a facility. Um, and uh, very fortunate in life and, and had some really good customers that are great friends and still great friends today. And I, I always loved training horses, but the auction business was really what I wanted to do. So trained horses, I guess, till I was 35. Um, Ended up, I won the world in the open three different times. My wife was reserved, you know. So I, I love the horses, and but didn't really want to be a horse trainer my entire life. You know, I wanted to do more than that. Mm -hmm. And I'd always loved the auction business, so I approached Ben Emerson, which was a real good friend of mine. I approached him about buying Western Bloodstock from Ben and Mill, and he said, "Well, let's think about it." And so they thought about it, and they got back to me, and we came up with an agreement and I bought it and and just kind of went from there. Um, I, I want to back up. So when you first got started, you got that first job where you already focused in on just cutting horses. You know, when we, when we first started, when we were kids, hell, we showed pleasure horses, reining horses, cutters. My grandpa, he, he trained cutters and some reiners and a little bit of everything. I mean, mm -hmm. in Georgia, you kind of ride whatever you can get. I think that's what you like listen to cow horse full contact and all those older guys that come on and and were trainers it's like they were just trying to pay the bills they just ride whatever it yeah, was you just you rode whatever people sent to you so we were we rode a little bit of everything but cutting was what i what i loved mm -hmm. and did y'all were you showing then and coming to texas a lot or uh we showed in georgia a lot and didn't come to texas a lot i came out oh a couple times and showed the youth when i was a kid but not not very much no mostly just there in georgia south alabama mm -hmm. and when you so when you graduated were you kind of just like 
I don't know what I want to do, but I want to do something with horses. Yeah, I, I knew growing up that I was going to do something with horses. Or mm -hmm. there was, I don't know that I really ever had any intentions of going to college because I didn't want to work in an office all day. Yeah, um, I like being outside working with the horses, and even now with the breeding barn and the sale company, I don't have to be in the office all the time. Yeah, I'm in the office more than I used to be, but. I'm still out and about a lot and mm -hmm. not, not just in the office. I, I enjoy working with all the people and, and the horses and the breeding and I just, I, I enjoy that stuff. Yeah. Well, so your first job, what did, what did it consist of when you started working for her? Was it, were you loping or were you actually getting to ride some cutters and train some horses? Yeah, or? no. When I first went there, I mean, I did everything. I fed, I cleaned stalls, I rode, she had eight or 10 horses and, I mean, I, I did it all mm -hmm. and and we kind of built from there and I started getting a few outside horses. So then we were able to hire some help to help do some things. But I mean, we did, did pretty much every part of it. Mm -hmm. And when I was, when I was kind of researching you, there was some point in there where you knew, uh, you knew to be competitive, you had to come to Texas, but you also knew if you wanted to ride really good horses, you're going to have to ride outside horses and, and be a, a trainer and not just kind of, you aren't going to be able to just buy some horses and, and do it all. No, absolutely. I mean, I did not grow in a, up in a wealthy family at all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in order to, to get better horses, I was going to have to ride horses for other people. And to do that, you've got to be competitive to get good horses. Mm -hmm. um, in South Georgia, it's a little tougher. Um, so it was a lot more opportunities and availability to those kind of horses and those kind of people in Texas. Not that there's not a lot of great people in Georgia because I still love Georgia. Um, but it's just not as many. There's there's a handful, but there's just not as many people that do it as there are here. Yeah. What would you say, like, <clears throat> like this is one of the first things I want to go over, like somebody that's, say, say a kid graduated high school, Want to be in the horse world? Where would you direct them to go? Do they need to get around what and be in the cutting horse deal? Direct them to get around Weatherford, work for somebody, start trying to take some outside horses, or how's how do you? I mean, you're very involved in it now, so still, how would you direct somebody to kind of get you know, into I, it? I think as a young person, I would I would definitely suggest going to work for as good a horse trainer as you can get your hands on. I mean, there, there's a lot of great horse trainers, and, and they're all over the country. They're not just in Texas anymore, for sure. They're, they're all over the country. So I would, I would definitely suggest going to work for the best guy you can get your hands on. Mm -hmm. and, and back to your story, you said you worked for her for like seven years in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, were you just like capped out an opportunity you thought you had to move and kind of branch out on your own? You know, I just we we were at a point that I didn't really see where I was going to go any further. Mm -hmm. Um, I could have probably stayed there forever. I mean, great people I worked for, great facility, but I just didn't see expanding to where I really wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. I had a. Uh, it reminds me of a comment somebody posted on one of my deals the other day, and they said, "Oh yeah, well they've been doing it the same way for twenty years," and that sounds. I said, that sounds terrible to me. Like, I wouldn't want to stay the same for 20 years. You know, you want to be growing and, and changing. Yeah, especially in today's time, you've got to you got to continuously change to grow. I mean, there's, there's more and more competition, so you have to continuously keep making changes to get better mm -hmm. in, in whatever business you do. So when you packed up, you moved to Texas, uh, you saw the future and the growth, the opportunity that was there. Were you at all, like, skeptical or scared or were you like i'm just gonna make this work or kind of what was your mindset then oh no absolutely i was scared to death <laughs> i mean i had my truck a trailer and i think i brought eight or ten horses with me and my dog um and very little money and didn't have very much money but uh, i was friends with glenn blankenship and he was nice enough to let me kind of lease some stalls from him there in lingleville uh, right across the street from Kobe and Paula Wood, and we became great friends and like family today. So it was it was an opportunity, but it was very very scary. Mm -hmm. There was there was nothing easy about it. <laughs> and how long how long did you go through that? And then you kind of did you get some breathing room where you like, hey, this could work. We can grow. We can, you know, 
build our own place. You know, the the first few years was was tough. I mean, I I had a horse to ride. I could survive. I could pay my bills. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of extra money, but I could I could pay my bills. And then, well, uh, I guess it was maybe six eight months after I moved here is when my wife and I got married, and we bought a horse from Kobe and Paula Wood, Dore Me, and that horse we ended up winning I don't know, eight or nine hundred thousand on. And that horse opened a lot of doors for us. Um, I won the world on him three times, won a lot of aged events on him. And that he opened up a lot of doors to a lot of new customers, met, met a lot of great people, uh, helped a lot of kids. I, I had a lot, of, a lot of parents for customers, but it was their kids that we were helping and, and was pretty successful in that and helping them obtain the goals that they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so we were, we were extremely fortunate and... It all came from that horse. That horse opened up a lot of doors for us. And that seems to be a lot of uh, like notable trainer stories. Is like there, there's always that one horse that actually. I mean, you've been putting on all the work, and and but when that opportunity comes, that one horse really sh shows your skills and gets your name out there. And it seems like, like you said, opens a lot of doors. It can. Yeah, I mean, you just. Every, everyone needs that one horse to, to open those doors for you, and then it just everything falls into place after that. And what was it like getting to that one horse? Were you, were you just riding outside uh, cutting horses for customers? Were you riding? I mean, you bought him, so you were riding some of your own, trading on them? or Yeah, we'd buy some horses and try to get them going a little better and resell them to make money that way. And But when we bought him... And it, it took six, eight months for everything to kind of start clicking. And then after that, it just, it was just easy. Yeah. Do, like, was, was he a hard one to train? Like, or did you know right off this just super easy and it was just smooth sailing or? No, he, he was, he was pretty easy. Um, several people had tried him before and, and didn't really get along with him that good, but he was for, for us, it was just a fit, you yeah. know, and not every horse fits every person. But when it does fit, they do amazing things, and it was just it was he was just that kind of fit for us. Yeah, I mean, it seems like I ask that because in lots of disciplines and roping and barrel racing and cutting and cow horse everything, it seems like a lot of the great ones have that story of they got passed on a lot because they didn't fit, or maybe they were hard to train and people didn't want to take the time to spend with them. They're a little harder, took a little longer for them to click, but just. You know, if it was the training or the right person, it seems like when it did, then it was just like it, they turned into great horses. Oh, absolutely. There's, I think there's a lot of horses that way that, you know, they just, they don't fit every single person. But when you find that person that it fits, it it's just amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. And then once it started clicking, um, you kind of brought up that, like a lot of kids rode them, a lot of youth people and, and learned and kind of got their start on that horse. Yeah, we did. We had um, Jordan Milner. She showed that horse a lot in the youth. I would show him in the open, and she'd show him in the youth. She won the world on him. Um, he he was he was special in that way. And then that just got more more people coming, and just opened a lot more doors for us. Mm -hmm. And you think like that horse had to know like how to operate differently in the open as opposed to having somebody that's a youth or novice person on Oh, there. yeah. I, I still think to today is the smartest horse I've ever been around. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like I come more from the calf roping side, and I worked for Sid Miller in college, and he had Pearl then. Cody was riding her and really winning a lot, and it was crazy to see, see Cody ride her and, you know, just – functioning you know going and winning those big pro rodeos and stuff and then sid could t sid would just go pick her up never even ride her and take her to a horse show and she just lets you know sid go in there and rope and you know just kind of do the deal and she it's like you said like she knew what she was doing oh yeah those those great horses they they know and and they know who's on them and what they need to do to to be successful for that person mm -hmm. so at some point you were you're doing that. You had success. You're you're having doors opened and and had money in your pocket. I assume from winning a lot and having those doors open. What were you thinking? What was your mindset of like where do I go from here? I mean, you said you were wanting to get into the auction deal and the the sale deal. Was it just like you knew that you couldn't be a horse trainer forever, or 
Uh, no, I mean, I could have trained horses for a long time, but that's that's not what I wanted to do. I mean, I wanted to be in the horse business, but I actually went to auction school when I was 21. Um, auctions have, have, I mean, growing up, I could go to a Friday night horse sale and sit there all night and just watch it. I just I just love horse sales. They're, they're a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was weird because the year so I bought Western Bloodstock in 13, and I actually had a three-year-old that year, Dual Smart Kitty for Rusty Simpson, which is a great friend of mine. And that mayor, Clay Johnson, came to work for me after I bought Western Bloodstock. Well, he went to win the 30 that year on that mare. So a lot of people thought, well, that's crazy. Why did you do that this year when you had that kind of three-year-old? Because she was a great mare, and I knew she had the potential to win the 30. But that's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to get in the horse sale business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, was that another mindset of kind of like you were in Georgia, like I'm kind of capped out? I mean, you hadn't won everything, but you'd been winning, and you'd you'd been there and done that. Were you like, okay, I'm ready for more opportunity? Yeah, you know, I mean, I I was a good horse trainer. Was I the best? Absolutely not. Um, but I could make a good living doing it. But I was ready to take the next step. I was 35 years old. I didn't want to be 60 years old training horses. That's that's not my goal in life. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew if I was going to do something different, it was time to make a change and and start moving in that direction. Okay. Um, so when you started looking at Western Bloodstock, like what drew you? A couple different things I want to ask there. Like what drew you to that sale to Western Bloodstock, and then also what drew you to wanting to buy one that was already established instead of starting your own? Well, I, I am a big believer in in buying something that's that's already started, whether it's successful or not, and building from there. To me, that's an easier way than starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, starting from scratch is easier, but for me, it, it was easier to start with something and build from there. And so I'd actually looked at Triangle Horse Sales with Cindy Bolin, and Western Bloodstock, because I actually didn't think there would be any chance of buying Western Bloodstock. It, it actually surprised me when they said they would sell it. So I thought, well, I'm going to look at the boat, and then we'll see which one I could potentially buy. Um, and when they said they would sell that one, that's that's the one I wanted, because to me, Western Bloodstock is the best. Mm -hmm. And did you see <clears throat> did you see an opportunity there to improve that? Like you could bring in new ideas and new things to to make that business bigger and better? Oh, absolutely. I, th I think we've made some some subtle changes here and there. We've never done anything just drastic, mm -hmm. but we make little changes every year, and it's, it's grown the business every single year. I, I mean, I think you get kind of that luxury of, like you said, buying something that's already started, that's already cash flowing. I mean, you've got to make payments on it or whatever the situation is, but you already have a name there going so you can kind of experiment with it of this may work may not and it's not going to break you whereas like if you were starting from nothing and you tried something drastically different then you're just gonna you're gonna go to zero and be out of business yeah. if you're passing through boswell oklahoma and have tire trouble holler at bar in tire and service they're a full service tire and automotive service shop so if you need new tires mechanical help or just a flat fixed in boswell oklahoma call bar in tire and service and they will get you fixed up and they are processing payments with us at Diversified Payments. You know, and, and for some people, it starting from scratch, that works. But for me, it just, and we started the breeding barn from nothing. But for this, it, it seemed better to just, if you could purchase a company that was already established and had a clientele, that would be an easier sell moving forward to make the little adjustments that you want to make to make it yours and and fit how you want it to work and and build it from there and then when did you when did you buy triangle so i've had it three years now and was that kind of the same situation did you see opportunity for growth there and change a few things and yeah i, I just wanted i wanted to keep growing the business so western bloodstock actually bought triangle sales i wanted to keep growing the business because you know, for me, any business I'm in, my goal is to build it to sell to someone bigger. 
Mm-hmm. So I want to keep building the business to make it more eye, eye appealing for for someone out there that wants to buy a company. I want to keep building it and growing it so that it it has more value because at at some point I do want to retire. Yeah, and that's another thing to talk about is a lot of people, especially you know somebody young, younger than me or myself. Like when you start something, it's a passion project or something, and it's like your baby or whatever, and then. A lot of people don't have that end in mind, but it sounds like maybe you started kind of with the end in mind. Like if you can, you're like, hey, if I can build something big, then somebody else will want to buy it and then I can exit and go do something else. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll never not work. I'll, I'll do something, but I, I do want to at some point, I mean, because we work seven days a week pretty much year round right now. And and that's okay. I'm, I'm fine with that. But at some point, I, I do want to slow down and maybe go fishing a little more. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think retirement like means like the mainstream retirement. People think about it as getting to 65 and, and then going and living in Florida or retirement community, you know, buying a boat or RV or whatever it is. And I think other people, especially like entrepreneurs, they're, <laughs> they're more on the, when you get to retirement, they usually hit it at a different age. And then, when you get there, it's just doing the things you want to do, which may be going to start another business or, you know, another opportunity. It's not necessarily just sitting sitting on your pocket. Oh yeah, yeah. I would I would never just sit down and do nothing. I'd I'd want to do something and and maybe it's working for the people who ever did buy mm-hmm. anything I have and work with them. I mean, even you know now from on the sales. I mean, from setup to tear down. I'm I'm there. I help set everything up. I help tear everything down. Um, I, I try to stay very hands-on in anything that I do. Yeah. I, I would say just like doing things that you want to do instead of things you have to do. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So at some point you, you mentioned the stallion station. I wanted to talk about that. Like when, when did that get started before Western bloodstock or kind of in the midst somewhere? So when I was still training horses, we had built a barn, a friend of mine, Carlos da Silva, um, at that time, they were still exporting a lot of horses to Brazil, and he needed somewhere to quarantine horses to export them to Brazil. So we built a little 20 stall barn and thought, well, that's a way to generate some revenue. I can rent, he, rent him these stalls and he can quarantine his horses to go to Brazil. So we did that for several years, five, six years. He was sending a lot of horses to Brazil. And then after that was kind of slowed down we had that barn there so we kind of converted a little bit of it into a small breeding facility and it was just me and debbie patterson when we started and the vets would come in and check the mares and stuff and everything else me and debbie did and so we did that for a few years and then i guess we did that a couple years and then me and charlie buchanan became partners and we started trying to grow it a little bit and then that's about the time that Clay came to work there. And so we still had the training facility and, and all of that and the breeding facility on one place. So that got a little hard. So I think after the second year Clay was there, Charlie and I went full-fledged partnerships and he bought part of the facility. So then Clay moved, him and Kelsey got married. So they he moved to Kelsey's place in Weatherford and they built a place there. And then so we took the covered arena filled it full of stalls <laughs> and turned the whole place into a full-fledged breeding facility and it's grown way faster than we ever expected um but we work very hard at it mm-hmm. and what's so tell us about the operation now what it is like what's what's the business model what services do y'all offer there oh we we're actually getting ready to start a rebranding here in the next 30 days but, I mean, obviously, we stand stallions. We breed mares there. We have our own recip herd. We foal out mares. We sell fit yearlings and brood mares for sales. There's there's really not a service we don't offer. There's 40-some-odd employees. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we had a little over 6,000 shipments this year of semen. So we, we breed a lot of mares. Yeah, a lot I of mean, mares. you're pretty much vertically integrated there with the – you can help people breed them and raise them get them ready for a sale and then put them in your sale. Yeah, it works really good because, you know, the sale business is, there's a little bit in the spring, but the your busiest time in the sale business is in the fall, and then the breeding is in the spring. So it, it works out good so that I'm not 
torn between the two at the same time. Mm -hmm. I can focus a lot on the breeding end of it, and I'm dealing with the people that I'm going to be selling their horses that fall. And then in the fall, I can focus on the cell fitting and the sales. So it, it actually, the two businesses work really well together. Yeah. And how did, so how did you build that up looking at y'all's, uh, y'all's roster there at the stallion station? Like how, how did you get those big horses in and how are you still doing that? I mean, now you're established, but at some point, you know, you had to go out and, and sell people on coming to you. Yeah. You know, it's, we've been very fortunate in that and we've, I've got a lot of connections, obviously, through the sale and met a lot of great people. And just through the connections, and I'm big on, you know, you treat people good, they're going to do business with you. You don't treat them good, they're not going to do business with you. So I've never, I have never to this day went out and asked someone to stand their stud there. They they have always called me first. And some we could take and some we couldn't. Um, but... I think it's just the job we do, and we're very fortunate to have the employees we have, and we've got the best there is, and we definitely couldn't do it without them. Um, so I, I think I think just our reputation gets those horses to come there. Mm -hmm. Do you say? Would you say that Western Bloodstock's kind of the same deal? It's you're not really having to go out and sell and market as much as word of mouth and. I mean, it already had the name when you bought it, but you have to maintain that reputation. Yeah, absolutely. You got to maintain that reputation. And and I go out and look at a lot of horses. Anytime someone wants me to come look at them, I go look at them. And you call them and check on them. But um, you don't have to be a used car salesman. You know, if you do a good job and you treat them the way they should be treated, they're going to come and do business with you. Mm -hmm. Are you able to... I mean, the market's always changing, especially in an auction environment. I mean, you really can't tell, but are you able to kind of ballpark? I'm sure you get people asking you that all the time, like, what do you think this horse would bring in your sale? And oh, that's my favorite question of the year. <laughs> no, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what your horse is going to bring. Yeah. I can tell you in an auction setting, in a live auction setting, your horse is going to bring the most it's worth that day. Yeah. You know what that is? Who knows? You know, the last couple of years, there's been horses sell for way more than I would think any horse would ever sell for. And then there's times that you're watching it and like, man, that horse ought to bring a little more than that. But you don't know what what did the X-rays say? Mm -hmm. Maybe the X-rays are bad on that horse. So, yeah, I don't I don't have the crystal ball to tell anyone <laughs> what their horse is worth. I get asked that about 500 times a day, starting about August until the end of the year, but. I, I don't have that crystal ball. I I have an idea yeah. of what that horse should be worth, but there's things around the world affect the prices of horses. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, for the majority of the people, horses are a hobby. So if something happens that changes their financial situation, the hobby goes first. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to always keep that in mind. And, and you're playing with people's emotions. You know, sometimes when you buy a horse, and I've I've bought some horses the last couple of years for some people, and I told them, you're paying too much for this horse, but you're having to buy these people's emotions. That's just part of it. There's there's some horses that if you really want them, you want that great mare, or that great stud, that's really a business, but then you have the emotion price in there too. You know, there's there's a business price. You can figure what a stud and a mare is worth mm -hmm. based off what their colts sell for and how many breedings that stud sells. But the emotional factor you have to buy. And that's just whatever price they want to put on it. Yeah. And then you have to make the decision if you want to pay that or not. Yeah, I had a I had a cow trader tell me one time I had some heifers I calved out and was trying to sell them. And they, you know, I, I thought I'd put them up there a little bit at the you know like at the top of the market you know maybe a little too high or right there at it and i was like you think they'll bring that and he said well if you you know want to sell them to an individual it only takes one person and uh he said but if you want to have an auction you got to find two people that want them exactly you gotta have two people that want them but that's that's hard for some people to understand sometimes that you know you're not just buying that horse you're you're buying those emotions so sometimes you're going to pay maybe two or three times what that horse is actually worth. So you as the buyer have to decide, is that horse worth that to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like going to auctions, any kind of auction, um, equipment auction or horse auction or cattle auction, 
it's you have that and there's i think that in every auction there's there's opportunities where you're like like you said you're you know i think that went a little too low or maybe you jump in and buy it because you think it went too low and then there's those ones it's like man that's just stupid money and you yeah. never can tell what it's going to be really no and 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 there are you know there's there's you can sit through the sales say in december you know we have seven sales that week and you can find some horses in there that's damn sure worth the money, but you got to sit there and watch, but you need to have done your homework ahead of time. And then there's some that go through there and you're like, wow, that's a lot, that's a lot of money for that horse. But you got to know the background of that horse too. And, and that seller and, and there's, you know, at the end of the day, the buyer has to decide if that's what they want to pay or not, mm -hmm. you know, cause you hear this, oh, they paid way too much for this horse. Well, it's not your money. It's not your decision. They, they decided if that was what they wanted to pay for that horse. Yeah, and also, you know, like you said, nobody has a crystal ball. And dealing with a horse, um, you know, cattle or equipment or something like that, you, you have a hard value. You know what you can get back out of it. A horse, I mean, you could buy one for 5000 and he goes wins half a million or something. Exactly, and that's happened. and It's happened a lot. I, I know there was a yearling we sold a few years ago and brought – Six thousand, I think, as a yearling. Well, that horse comes back to the fraternity when it was a three-year-old, makes the open and non-pro finals, and wins over a hundred thousand. You know, but then you've seen them the other way too. I mean, it's which cuttings all. I mean, there's I don't like the word luck, but <laughs> there's there's things there. I mean, you're dealing with a herd of cattle and four helpers and your horse, and it's got to be sound. And there's there's so many factors that go in there and variables that so many things can happen and everything's got to line up on that night for it to all work. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, kind of getting back to the auction deal there's, so now, um, the world's changed a lot, got online and now we're seeing a lot of these online horse sales pop up and I've had some of those guys on and we'll have some more horse sale people on in the future. How do you view those sales popping up? Um, yeah, I know Cody Shelley was on here, and I'm partners with him in an equipment auction. I'm not a fan of online sales. Uh, I'm just, I'm not a fan of them for horses. I, I think that people make better decisions when they can see that horse. We, we're forced to put on a few online sales now because that's just the way the business is. And there's, there's probably a place for them for some horses. I don't think they're the place for the high end horses. And to me, if you're if you're going to spend especially a big amount of money on a horse, you need to lay your eyes on that horse. You need not a picture, not a video. We know what pictures and videos can be done. Mm -hmm. You can edit them things all you want and make them look like a whole different horse. You you need to see that that horse in person. You you need to see what you're buying. You're not buying a car. Yeah, you're buying a living animal, and you you need to see it. That's that's just my opinion. Some people love the online auctions. I'm not a fan of them. Yeah, and the real reason I'm not a fan of them is they put people out of jobs. You know, ringmen and auctioneers; those are not just jobs; those are careers. And an online auction, you don't use them, so you're putting careers out not just a little side hobby weekend job. Those are careers. So I'm not a fan of them for that reason is my biggest reason. I'm not a fan of them. Do you think, do you think it's direct competition to you or are you, do you think you're just in, it's two different things? You know, honestly, when they first started, I thought, well, maybe it's going to hurt us a little bit, but it hasn't. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's more online auctions now than there's ever been. Our consignments for the San Alphabet Fraternity Sale coming up is have increased. We got more than we've ever had. Um, so I don't I don't think they hurt the horses we sell, but like I said, they put people out of jobs. Yeah, and I don't like that. I, I would say like I saw a, a deal the other day on Facebook, and it said the people at the bottom compete, and the people at the top collaborate. And um, I just think like. <clears throat> I know you don't like them for that aspect, but also don't like, I don't also don't think they're your competition. You know that no. I think that, you know, they're serving a different purpose and a different crowd and a different yeah. set of horses. And 
it's kind of two different things. Like you said, those those high end people, well, they don't even have to be high end, but like you said, the emotions. I mean, y'all could have the same horses, and the emotions can take over at a live auction yep. and, and make that horse bring more. Yeah, I don't. I mean, and there's there's a place for them. I I'm a little. I don't I don't like it because of the jobs, but there there's a place for them, and and they do fine. I I watch them. They they seem like they do fine, mm-hmm. but. I don't think they're competition for us simply because you take all the emotion out of it. You're bidding on a computer. Mm-hmm. So there's no emotion there at all. Where in a live auction setting, you have emotions and emotions spend more money. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, you get that camaraderie of, of people coming together at that live auction and, you know, meeting new people and, Seeing what this horse is doing and these owners are doing and all that type of stuff. Well, it's more it's more of an event. Mm-hmm. It, it's not just a horse sale. It's it's an event. I mean, you take the fraternity sales, we're there for a week, and there's thousands of people there. It's and people come to Fort Worth just for that. So I mean, it's it's a huge event, and people like to attend events. Mm-hmm. Um, another venture you've got into lately is the Gold Buckle Fraternity. Um, how did that come about? Uh, Shane Hanchi called me and I really didn't know what he wanted. <laughs> he wanted to come meet with me. So he came and Shane and Haven came. Did y'all and, have any connection or just, you just no, knew who he was? No, I knew who he was, but didn't have any connection before that. Um, so they came to my office and we sat and talked and they told me what they were planning on doing and wanted to do and asked me if I'd help with it. And, and it sounded intriguing. Never been in the rope horse still actually own a calf horse now. Um, but had never been in the roping deal, but I, I liked their thoughts and their ideas and what they were wanting to do. You know, they wanted to make sure they paid out big payouts, and I like that. Anything we can do to pay out more money for these horses to win increases their value, so it helps everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we we talked for a little bit and then ended up bringing Caleb in for the team roping side of it, and it's it's been a lot of fun. We've we've paid out a little over a million and a half in the first two events. The next event's in November. And that's probably going to end up with six, seven hundred thousand added there. Um, so it's it's been a lot of fun. Do you see that as like a a new opportunity? I mean, you I hear lots of talk about it. Like that's kind of like a new frontier of this rope horse fraternity and breeding for specifically rope horses and stuff like that. Do you you see that as maybe a whole another avenue to go down? Oh, absolutely. I think I think the the rope horse fraternity industry is it's growing extremely fast. And I think the next few years is going to grow even faster because there's, there are several of these fraternities that, that pay really well. And it's a, it's another avenue for these guys to make a really good living roping without having to run up and down the road constantly to rodeos. Um, and you know, like, especially with ours being a, a stallion nominated event. And then we also have the breeder sod pot too. And we've had, tons of people that just want to be a part of that or we have a long waiting list for our stallions the breeders is filling up so i think it's gonna it's gonna open up a lot of more a lot more avenues to sell colts because not all your colts are going to cut or cow horse some of them some of them are going to need to do something else and and i don't say that in well they're not good enough to cut or not good enough to cow horse they wrote because i think any discipline now no matter what discipline i don't care if it's team pinning like you've got to have a good horse. Like the competition is so strong now that whatever discipline you do, you've got to have a good horse. It's just not every horse is going to do that event. Mm-hmm. So you got to find the event that that horse will excel in. And it may be bred to be a great cutter, but maybe it's a better calf horse or team roping horse. Yeah. Or team pinner, whatever. But you you've got to have a top-notch horse to win at any discipline now yeah and I, I mean i think like you said it, it's it's not competing it's collaborating and if if those if all these trainers can kind of get together and you know used to like we talked about the the trainers <clears throat> just if it wasn't doing good in one event then they would just switch it to another event and train it that way but now everybody specialized so maybe it needs to be more of a collaborative thing like Hey, this this horse is not cutting, but I know a rope horse guy over here might go try him over there, or you know whatever that event is. 
And I think I think that is happening more because I, I know some of the the cutting trainers that they'll have one that's not working and and they'll they'll send them to one of the rope horse guys because they feel like it'll do that event better and it and it's worked. Mm-hmm. Um, because I mean it's just the competition these days and in every discipline is just crazy good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it takes the the top guys. I mean, you can see it in now that rodeos are on TV all the time and in the cutting horse and cow horse deal. I mean, to be at the top, I mean, the, what makes those people stand out is the horsepower, I think. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it don't matter how good you are. If you don't have the horsepower that year, you're not going to be at the top that year. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean you won't be back the next year, but you've got to have the horsepower that year to be at the top. Yeah. Um, a little bit like the rope horse fraternity. I mean, it's somewhat new, but... To me, it's it's still kind of confusing, which I haven't dove off in it or anything, but seems like there's these different associations and everybody does it a little bit different. Do you think uh, it needs to be a collaboration deal and have kind of everybody merge and then it could before it could turn into something like the cutting horse fraternity? I, I think they are are a little different in little ways, but it it looks like they keep kind of migrating to to getting closer together. the The only thing that I see that that definitely, in my opinion, needs to be worked on and get get more collaborated on is the judging. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's mainly what I was talking about. You know, if you have so for cutting, for instance, there's several cutting associations, but they all use NCHA's judges scorecard. So it. When you're home working, practicing, studying, what have you, you know what that judge is going to be looking for when you go to the show. And Cole Davidson and I were actually just sitting down talking about this the other day. If if they if there's a way for everyone to agree on a single scorecard, so that no matter which fraternity these guys went to, they know what the judge is going to be judging mm-hmm. and what they're looking for. So they know what to work on at home to have that horse the best, to score the best, to win the most money. That's that's the only thing I see right now that 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 really needs to be worked on somehow. How that happens, I don't know. Yeah. But it that needs to happen. In order to grow that industry to what it really could be, I think. Everybody get on the same page. Yes. I mean, that's kind of what I see is you have some of them that are only time or heavily weighted on time, and then some take more of the judging side of it. Which, I mean, both have their pros and cons. Like, if you're going to go be fast, then your horse probably did a lot of the right things. Um, so you p- would probably have a a good judge's score also. Whereas, if you're not worrying about time, you can make sure your horse is being more correct. So there's pros and cons. But like you said, if everybody got on the same page, whichever page it was, then you know, you'd have the same common goal to work for. Like I either need to be fast or I need to just make sure my horse is working good and not worry so much on time. Yeah. I mean, cause at the end of the day, they're, you're trying to build those horses to eventually be an NFR horse, hopefully, or a world series horse or what have you. But it, that, that's the one thing I see that, that needs to come together and, and have some sort of official judging card Mm -hmm. and then maybe have someone or some group that has some training for judges because right now you see a lot of the same guys judging all the fraternities that's not really good for the industry i don't think because you're just judging or showing your horse to the same guy all the time Mm -hmm. you need to try to get a pool of judges that are trained on what you're looking for what you're not looking for in order to judge those events and so you could, you know, not show the same guy four times in a year because he may just not like your horse. Yeah. <laughs> so it, that's that's the one thing that, to me, to ever grow that industry to what it can be will have to happen at some point. And like you said, I mean, I think the the growth is there, like you said, because these horses have an out after they're, they're aged out of those fraternities and stuff. They can go be a rodeo horse or go to – you know, an older guy that just does it on the weekends. Yeah, I mean, they they can have a lifelong career. Not there's a huge career after the fraternities, and that's that's what those guys are training them for is the longevity. But that that one thing, the judging has got to get 
somehow it's got to get closer together. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of walk through like y'all's y'all's fraternity, the gold buckle fraternity. What is how is that set up as far as the money, the incentives, and then how it's judged and pays pays out? So anyone can enter our fraternity. It's not just limited to horses that are sired by gold buckle stallions. Any anyone can enter the fraternity. The sal- the stallion side pot is a side pot. And then the breeder side pot is a side pot. So there's three different ways you can enter. And then we have, you know, the open and then the intermediate and the limited. And then we have the breakaway, the tie down, healing in, heading in healing. Um, and it's it pays extremely well. It, it pays very well. You know, there's there's typically there'll be just between the two side pots, there'll be about half a million added. Plus what's added right now, it's it's set to be 10,000 added in each event in De- in November. But depending on sponsors we get, that'll increase. We, we do have it set up. It's not set up to where we really make any money. It, it's set up to pay out as much money as we can. Mm-hmm. And that's that's all of our goal is we, we want, all of us together want to pay out as much money as we can because in the end that helps everyone. That helps your breeders, that helps your stallion owners. That helps you as a rider. It helps the owners. It, it keeps people wanting to come back. It helps the industry as a whole the more we can pay out. Mm-hmm. And and so how's that one judged and scored? So that one, we use four judges, drop the high and low, and then the time is factored in as your third judge. And is it so is that the time and then the judging is, is basically weighted the same? Yes. So you need to you need to go be fast as well. You want to be fast, but your horse has got to be correct, too. Mm-hmm. If the horse isn't correct, that's going to hurt you more than being fast. Yeah. And what is, I mean, we mentioned earlier, like you you built the sale deal for an exit. Is that something you see? I mean, it seems, you probably think long term. So I don't. I doubt you got into this deal just to get into it. Like, what do you see going with the gold buckle for charity, like could it be sold or turned into something or get bigger and grow into something more? Or? Yeah, I, th- I think all of our goals is to grow it as big as we can. But obviously, I mean, with any business, there's always a bigger fish out there. Mm-hmm. So if we do a good job and we grow it to what it potentially could be, someone may want to buy it from us one day. Mm-hmm. If not, we're going to continue to try and grow it every year to get it bigger every year. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we'll ever get to a point that we're happy and settle at that point. We're always going to continuously try to grow it. Yeah, I think, like, it's a good outlook. Like, it seems to me like you focus more on the inputs and the outputs. A lot of people, I mean, I've done it before, too. I try to, I try to stay away from it, but a lot of people are going to look at, like, how much money can I make doing this or um, how much can I win doing this or whatever – they look at the output part of it instead of the input, and you try to put as little in as possible. If I practice like two days a week, can I go win this or whatever? But I, I think if you focus on just making a good product, doing the rep- repetitive, whether it's riding a horse or making phone calls or you know whatever in your business or field of expertise, just doing the input every day, and then I think the outputs, you know, they come. Yeah, and I, I try to look at every business I have, I would rather make a little bit of money for a long time than a lot of money one time. And I think if you look at it that way, your longevity is going to be there. Mm -hmm. If you go into something trying to get rich today, you're probably going to be broke tomorrow. But if you'll make just a little bit of money for a long time, that money is going to add up and you're going to do better in the long run. Yeah. Um, what are I mean? You've been in the you've had Western Bloodstock for what eleven years now. This will be eleven yeah. years, and then the Triangle sells, and y'all sell a lot of high dollar horses. Do you have any like memorable moments or memorable horses through those years that just stand out to you? Most small businesses fail in the first five years of opening. There's a few issues that cause businesses to close. One is paying too much in overhead expenses. Two is not getting enough customer traffic. 
and three is not converting enough of that traffic into sales. If you want to ensure success in your business, these issues must be addressed. Check out the link below and book a call with me to see how we can help keep your business open and thriving so you're not just another statistic. Yeah, I mean, Would She Be Magic was the first horse we sold for over a million, and that was ever at a cutting horse sale. So that one we'll always remember, and then we got lucky and sold two others since then for over a million, but that just doesn't happen very often. But I'll, I'll never forget that, Mayor, because she was, she was the first one. Mm -hmm. what's, what's some good financial advice that you've learned in your life and that you would tell somebody else? You know, I don't, I don't know that I would give them advice, but I'll tell you what I do. I, I like to take what I make and invest in land. I, th I think land's a very good investment. They don't make any more of it. And, and, you know, you accumulate as much as you can. And when you decide to retire and you don't want to take care of all that land, you can always sell that land for more than you paid for it. Mm -hmm. So if, if I was going to advise someone on what to do with their money, I would buy land. And are you on that note, like, are you buying facilities? Are you improving it? Or are you just buying raw land to run some cows on? Yeah, and just buy raw land. Um, I've bought a couple of places that had houses on them, um, but I'd, I'd rather just buy raw land mm -hmm. and run some cows on it, clear it. And it doesn't matter if it's woods, just clear it when you have time, but you don't have to rush into it. But you can't go wrong buying land. Yeah, and you're just looking at at it over the long term. Yeah, because he, you know, I'm 47. If I hold on to it for another 20 years, well, it's going to be worth a lot more money than it is today. Right. You know, don't put yourself in a bind and have more payments than you can make. But if you can, if you can buy some land and and pay down on it enough where your payments are affordable, where you can pay for that land with some cattle or horses or what have you, uh, it's just a good investment in my opinion. Yeah, and I've. I, I listened to a lot of real estate people and um, what I got out of it, like everybody's done it, you know, a million different ways. And like, that's the thing is it's hard to pick what you want to do. But the main thing I think they all have in common is they never had to sell. Like I never got in a bind to have to sell because when you do that, you're probably going to lose your ass. But if you can, like you said, keep it long term, if you can afford to not get rid of it. If it's, not emotional thing like you can just one day if you want to sell it down the road you're going to make a lot of money if you don't want to sell it then it's you're still going to have it yeah i mean it's it's the one thing you can buy in life that there is no more of it mm -hmm. there, there will never be any more land so I man it doesn't even matter if it's way out in the country because you know 20 years from now it's probably not gonna be in the country anymore mm -hmm. the way they're building subdivisions everywhere now and and that's the sad thing is there's you know you can't even find big tracks to buy anymore especially in the area we're in yeah, um, because they're just build houses everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if you can find that land 20 miles out of town, 30 miles out of town in 20 years, town's probably going to be there. Right. So that land's going to be worth a lot more than you paid for it. Mm -hmm. Um, What would you tell somebody like getting started, like c coming out of school um, kind of like you did, you knew you wanted to be involved in horses. You really didn't know, what aspect or or what to do would you tell them i mean we, we talked about somebody wanting to be a trainer would you tell them to go work for somebody or, or look towards the future like go learn as much as possible or you know I, I think the biggest thing is work hard no matter what you do whether you go to work for someone or you try it on your own if you don't get up every morning and you'll go to work and you'll work hard all day long you're going to be successful at something mm-hmm you know, obviously, if, if you want to be a top horse trainer, I would I would find the best horse trainer I could get a job with if I had to work for free. And you go and you bust your butt, and they're going to help you be successful. But you you've got to go work, and there's that's that's hard to find these days. Yes, yeah. not a lot of people want to work anymore. But if you'll put in the work, you'll be successful at whatever you want to do. Yeah, I I've seen. I've been thinking about it recently. Like, if you just get good in at anything, like if if you were the best stall cleaner, like and that was all you did, and you're like super good at that, you could go get a job anywhere. You're going to be in demand. You're going to and you're going to get top pay. 
because somebody wants you that bad and getting the best barns and stuff. It, it doesn't matter what job you do. If you'll do it to the very best and be at the top of that group that does that job, you will always have a job. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, at some point, like you talk about luck, hard work meets opportunity. Like at some point there's an opportunity coming. Like Absolutely. Um, we talked a little bit about Miles Baker. Like, you know, it's not like he just was an overnight success. He was working really hard, and then he got an opportunity, and then it came together. And Absolutely. He's worked his butt off, and he's had some opportunities, and look what he does now. Mm -hmm. What What do you think we can do to grow the horse market? I think, um, I think a lot of times, like, we get hung up on the wrong things in, in our world because we don't want to be a part of mainstream, and – but I think we need to like be reaching out to get, we want to get people from the outside in to grow it. I think, um, kind of what is your take on that? Well, you, to grow it, you obviously, you have to continuously have new people come in. And I think that's the last few years is why we have grown so much is so many new people have come in. I don't know if it's the Yellowstone effect or what have you, but there's a lot of people have come into the business and that's, that's helped. I mean, you see entries have gone up, horse prices have gone up. So we have to continuously try to get those people in. And, and we have to remember, this is a hobby. So hobbies have to make sense at some point. People are willing to lose some money, but they're not willing to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on their hobby. Mm -hmm. So that's our job as show producers and associations to keep the pay, keep them payouts up as high as we can possibly keep them so they do see a return in the end. They may not get it, but at least there's some blue sky that they think they can get it. And hopefully one year they get it. So we have to do everything we can to keep the payouts up, to keep the new people coming in. You have to, you have, to have something to draw them in. And, I mean, the love of the horse will bring them in to an extent, but to do it at a high level, they have to see where it could make sense at some point. Yeah, I mean, the like you said, there'll be some emotion there, but a lot of the smart business people like you show them this horse and like here's the return you're going to get on it if it works out. Here's the downside and like have a whole plan for it. Then you know they're more likely to put their money up. Well, yeah, especially a, a stud or a mare. I mean, you've got to look at those as a business. You know, especially to a new buyer coming in because he don't have the emotions to that horse. So you've got to have some sort of business plan for him. Okay, well, if we do this and if it all works, this is what we could potentially could do. You can't guarantee it because anything can happen. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be at least a plan that you can execute and hope that it works that way. And what about, so that's bringing new people in. What about keeping people in it? Like as far as I, I think a lot of that would be the youth side. you got to have a very strong youth organization coming up to keep people in that yeah absolutely you got you got to keep the youth very strong mm -hmm. because that's that's your future you you've got to keep them coming in and i think for the most part most most associations and disciplines they do a pretty good job at that of doing as much as they can for the youth and i think as long as they continue that and improve on it anywhere they can they'll all benefit from it and i think it's i mean it's all kind of tied together because if you can keep the money in there you know, the kids can see, like, if a kid just sees broke and and unhappy and fights and struggling all the time, they're more apt to go off and do something else. But if there's money coming in from the outside and everybody's happy and getting paid and stuff, then it, it's more enticing to stay in there. Absolutely. Anybody wants to do something that they enjoy and love if they can financially make it work. Mm -hmm. So... And as long as long as they can keep these payouts moving in the direction they are and every discipline is doing it i mean payouts are going up in everything that i've watched and so as long as we can keep that happening that'll that'll keep the youth coming you're not going to keep them all but you can keep a lot of them yeah and i always ask everybody at the end lighthearted, uh what's your favorite restaurant adv's you go there often when i'm in fort worth that's yeah. my favorite place i love it <laughs> I think we've got that answer before. I haven't tried it out, but I have to go. It's a great place. Well, thank you for coming on. How can um, everybody check you out, get in touch with you, want to sell a horse, more about the futurity deal? Um, 
all the things. I'll just call call the office, call my cell phone. Either, either way, they can they can get in touch with me, with me one way or the other. Cool. Well, y'all check out Western Bloodstock, um, Triangle Cells, Gold Bug Futurities, uh, Brazos Valley, Brazos Valley Stallion Station. Um, check all that out. And uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you.